You know, for centuries, controlling the seas has meant controlling your destiny. And today, when a brand new super high-tech warship rolls out of a US shipyard, it's more than just a launch party. It's a pretty big deal. It's the nation putting its cards on the table, a clear signal to the rest of the world that it's serious about staying strong on the seas and protecting its interests across the globe. And let me tell you, Nothing screams future quite like the Navy's Zumwalt-class destroyers. These things are basically stealth bombers for the ocean. What I mean is, they're designed to slip through enemy defenses completely unnoticed and deliver a massive punch. They were originally designed to get in close to shore and support troops on land with some serious heavy firepower, but they're also jack-of-all-trades warships, fully equipped to take out enemy planes, other ships, and lurking submarines. Their look is totally unique and honestly straight out of a sci-fi movie. See how the hull leans inward above the waterline? That's called a tumble home design. Most ships flare outwards to cut through waves, but this design does the opposite to deflect radar signals away from the source, making the ship a ghost on enemy screens. That weird shape, combined with a deck house made of special composite materials that hides all the antennas and sensors, makes the Zumwalt incredibly sneaky. Get this, the Navy says that even though it's 40% bigger than our other destroyers, its radar signature is more like that of a small fishing boat. That's an incredible disappearing act for a 600-foot-long warship. But being stealthy isn't just about fooling radar. These ships have a whole bag of other tricks. For starters, they're as quiet as a nuclear submarine underwater. Think about that for a second a massive surface ship that makes as little noise as a vessel designed specifically for silent running. That's a huge advantage, allowing it to hunt subs or sneak into position without being detected by sonar. They do it with things like heavily muffled exhausts and specially designed propellers that reduce cavitation, the noisy bubbles that form as propellers spin. They also manage their heat signature, which is crucial for avoiding heat-seeking missiles. They do this by mixing hot engine exhaust with cold air and venking it, and sometimes even by actively running seawater over the hull to cool it down. Powering all this is a wild integrated power system. It's basically its own self-contained futuristic power grid. It generates a whopping 78 megawatts of electricity. That's enough to power a small city. This power isn't just for getting around. It was designed to handle the massive energy demands of future weapons like railguns and high-powered lasers. But as you can imagine, cramming all this amazing first-of-its-kind tech into one platform is incredibly complex and costs a fortune, which really gives you a peek into the massive challenges of American shipbuilding today. I'm eager to hear your thoughts in the comments below. If this sophisticated ship were featured in a movie, which actor would you cast as its captain? Also, what are your coolest nickname ideas for the Zumwalt? I'll pin the most unique suggestions. Now, let's explore further. So, what's the real price tag? All right, let's talk about the cost of these Zumwalt destroyers, because the real number is absolutely mind-blowing. Each one of these ships costs somewhere between $3.5 and $4.4 billion just for the physical construction. But that's not the whole story, not by a long shot. The entire program for just three ships ended up costing about $22.5 billion when you factor in all the years of research and development. That comes out to an average of $7.5 billion per ship. You could build a whole fleet of conventional destroyers for that price. So how did the price get so insane? Well, the Navy originally planned to build a whole class of 32 of them. Spreading the R&D costs across that many ships would have been manageable, but when the order got slashed to just three, all those massive upfront R&D costs for developing the new hull, the radar, the power system, the software, had to be spread across that tiny number of ships. The price jump per ship was so huge, it actually triggered something called the Nunn-McCurdy Amendment, a law that forces a program to be reviewed by Congress when costs spiral out of control. It's basically a stop and justify your existence moment for the Pentagon, and it's a really big deal. A few things went wrong to drive up the costs and shrink the program. The tech was insanely complicated. 
putting all that brand new experimental gear together was a much bigger headache than anyone expected. It wasn't just one new system. It was dozens of them all needing to talk to each other perfectly. For example, the original dual band radar was a revolutionary piece of tech, but getting it to work was a nightmare and it was eventually simplified to save money. Every step of the way, integrating this gear took more time and more money than planned. The design was a challenge. That cool looking stealthy hull and all the fancy internal systems were just plain hard to build. Shipbuilders are used to making ships that curve outward, not inward. The unique angles and use of new materials required entirely new techniques, leading to delays and higher labor costs. They even had to ditch the plan for a high-tech composite deck house on the last ship and use good old-fashioned steel to save some money, which slightly impacts its stealth profile. They changed the mission mid-game. This is a big one. The Zumwalt was built around its two huge advanced gun systems. These weren't just regular cannons, they were supposed to fire a special GPS-guided rocket-boosted shell called the Long Range Land Attack Projectile, or LRLAP. The problem? As the number of ships went down, the cost per shell went up, eventually hitting almost a million dollars per round. It was just too expensive to use. Suddenly, the ship's main weapons were useless, like building a race car and then not being able to afford tires. So the Navy had to pivot. Now they're actually ripping those multi-billion dollar guns out and replacing them with launchers for hypersonic missiles. It's a smart change that makes the ships incredibly powerful in a new way, giving the US a conventional prompt strike capability, the ability to hit a target anywhere on Earth in under an hour. But it just goes to show how tricky and expensive it is to launch something so new and unproven. The whole Zumwalt saga, as dramatic as it is, really shines a bright light on the bigger, systemic issues facing the entire U.S. shipbuilding industry. The Navy has this huge, ambitious goal of growing the fleet to 515 ships by 2054. The reason is simple, to keep pace with rapidly expanding naval powers, especially China. But that plan is going to cost an absolute fortune. We're talking about $40 billion a year just for new ships. And that's before you even pay for the fuel, sailors, and maintenance to keep them all running. The problem is, the American shipbuilding industry is already struggling to keep up with the orders it has now. It's like a perfect storm of problems. We're seeing constant delays, costs going through the roof, not enough skilled workers, and a supply chain that's stretched dangerously thin. Here's a quick rundown of the main headaches, and they're all connected. It feels like every major shipbuilding project is falling behind schedule. The new aircraft carrier Enterprise is up to 26 months late. The new Columbia-class ballistic missile submarines, the nation's top defense priority, are already running a year or more behind. Virginia-class attack submarines are two to three years behind schedule. This isn't just a matter of waiting longer. These delays have a ripple effect across the entire Navy, messing up deployment schedules and leaving gaps in our defense. And building a destroyer or submarine now takes eight to nine years when it used to take five or six just two decades ago. You can't build these complex ships without highly skilled people, and shipyards are having a really hard time finding and keeping them. A lot of the most experienced pros, the master welders and engineers who have been doing this for decades, are retiring. It takes a long, long time to train up the next generation to that level of expertise, and right now there's a massive experience gap that's slowing things down and leading to more mistakes. This is a huge worry that keeps Pentagon planners up at night. For some of our most important ships like submarines, about 70% of the critical parts come from a single supplier. These are called sole source providers. Think about that, if that one company that makes a special kind of valve or a specific computer chip has a fire, goes bankrupt, or gets bought out, the whole production line for a multi-billion dollar submarine can grind to a halt. It's a massive national security vulnerability. Just too much work. The shipyards are being asked to build more and more, but they're already swamped. The sheer tonnage of ships being built has shot up 80% since 2014, and it's only going to get busier. 
The few large shipyards capable of building these complex warships are stretched to the absolute breaking point. You can't just snap your fingers and open a new shipyard. It takes decades of investment and development. On top of building new ships, there's a huge, ever-growing pile of repairs waiting to be done on the existing fleet. Right now, a third of our attack submarine fleet is sitting in dry dock, either undergoing or waiting for maintenance. That's way more than the Navy's 20% target. This maintenance backlog means fewer ships are ready to deploy at a moment's notice. It wears out the crews and the ships that are deployable, and sometimes leads to ships being cannibalized for parts to keep others running. And the AUKUS deal adds pressure. Then there's the new security deal to sell nuclear-powered submarines to Australia. It's a fantastic strategic move to strengthen our alliances in the Pacific. But here's the catch. Our shipyards are already struggling to build enough subs for us. To make good on that promise to Australia, they'd have to boost production like crazy to a rate they haven't hit in decades. It would be incredibly difficult and expensive. The big fear is that if they can't ramp up that fast, we might end up actually selling submarines that the US Navy desperately needs for its own fleet. So, what's the bottom line? Look, when a ship like the Zumwalt hits the water, it's a moment of real pride. It's a stunning piece of engineering. It shows the world that America can still innovate, dream big, and build incredible things. It's a tangible glimpse of the future of naval power, a floating testament to what's possible. But it's also a cautionary tale. It forces us to look at the serious, deep-rooted problems in our shipbuilding industry. We can have the best designs and the most brilliant engineers in the world, but if we can't build things on time and on budget, we've got a major problem that affects our national security. The Navy has a bold and necessary vision for the future, but getting there is going to be a tough road. It's going to take a ton of money, some really smart and consistent planning from our leaders, and a major national-level effort to get our industrial base back in top shape for the challenges of this century.